Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Burn Bootcamp podcast. My name is Devin Klein, and I am the visionary co-founder of Burn Bootcamp. And I am here with a very, very special guest today. We have Lauren Palmer in the building, uh, and she is here not only representing Burn Bootcamp Pineville, but she's also representing the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, LLS. Uh, she's got, uh, a, I would say, a very emotional, a very touching story that she wants to share with you today about her and her family, um, particularly her son, Jennings, who I'll let her share her story, but who has been involved with LLS uh, through his battles with cancer. And so we are so excited to have you here today for you to share your story and just have this platform in order to inspire, empower, and and potentially transform the lives of, of people out there who are going through something similar that yeah. you've gone through. I know that it's very important to you to really be, for lack of a better term, the, the voice or a, the mouthpiece of the organization to really make sure that we are spreading awareness and, and, and saving more kids' lives, like you said, so parents can yeah. spend more moments with them. So we're gonna get really deep into your story yeah. and um, Let's, why don't we just get, uh, let everybody know a little bit more about you and your background and your family set up, and then we'll set the stage to then kind of move into when you got that shocking news. Yeah, sure. So I'm um, first and foremost a wife. I've been married for almost 13 years to my husband, Joel. And I have four kids. Um, my oldest, Caroline, she's 10, and Jennings is eight. And then I have almost six-year-old twins, mm -hmm. Charlotte and Henry. So... That's really what keeps me busy. Yeah, That's busy, busy. Huh? Very busy. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, you know, you have four children uh, and, you know, your son ends up, you know, not feeling well mm -hmm. and, you know, you really start to worry. Walk me through that time yeah. when you were in the moment. Yeah, sure. So actually, when he was not feeling well, I was very pregnant with my twins. So we... We're expecting twins, that was a surprise, as it often is when you find out you're having multiples. And so Joel and I really thought that was gonna be life's greatest challenge. Uh, we never saw ourselves having such a large family. Um, so we were preparing for their birth. I was 36 weeks along, and I was dropping off Caroline and Jennings at preschool every day, and Jennings just had these recurring fevers, and he just wasn't himself, and it just kept happening. How long was it lasting about, like, the recurring uh, fevers? A couple months. Okay, so Yeah, it was but like... then he would, like, get better, and then he would get sick again. And then finally, here I am, just very pregnant mm -hmm. and just, like, annoyed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I need to get this kid better. I'm about to have these babies. Like, just such an innocent, naive, completely did, had no awareness of mm -hmm. what, could, what could be ahead. Took him to the pediatrician. He was going to be diagnosed with an infection because his lymph node was swollen. Mm -hmm. Um, but God gave me this power to say something. And I know, I know that now looking back, um, because I don't know anything about the blood system or anything about leukemia, but I said to the pediatrician, I said, something's wrong with his immune system. And so that prompted her to do blood work. Um, and if she had not done the blood work, it's really hard to think about what would have happened mm -hmm. because he was so sick. His blood was so sick and so ill that it was an immediate leukemia diagnosis and we had to go to the hospital right away. Mm. It was not, hey, go get your bags and like, we'll get you set up. It was, here, take your big belly of twins and your four-year-old daughter at the time and your toddler and go to the hospital because he's critically ill. Um, it would just, people say your life flips and like, that's exactly what it does. It just flips upside down and completely changes literally in a moment. What were the emotions? Were you shocked, scared? It's a lot of shock, like, I'm yeah. sure that there's just a whirlwind of different I do remember crying. I do remember crying when she said leukemia. What's so funny is I didn't really even know what that meant. I just knew it was not a good word. Mm -hmm. I knew the way that she told me. Of course, now I'm like a momcologist, and I know everything, single thing there is to know about it. But then I was like, I just knew it was bad. She asked me to sit down. She told me I had leukemia. My husband, Joel, was literally, literally getting on a flight to go on a work trip. And at that point, our greatest worry was, is he going to be gone and I'm going to go into labor with the twins? Mm -hmm. I literally caught him as he was boarding and said, you have to not get on that plane. You have to come right now. Like I was like hyperventilating essentially. Right. 
But then your body just starts to go into a sense of shock and like kind of me, how I process it was just like, all right, let's just just get this, let's just take care of things, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was in that state for a while, mm-hmm. you and know? You had twins on the way too, right? So like, My body just kind of went into like handle it mode. <laughs> like I was grieving, the, right. but that wasn't like physically uh, visible mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when the twins arrive and you have some, you know, unique circumstances around their birth now that, you know, that was the thing on your mind and now you get this cancer diagnosis and you know, you still have to maintain everything as a mom and keep the family going mm-hmm. in the right direction. Yeah. But at the same time, now you are battling immediately, jumping yeah. into this battle that I would assume that you're not too prepared for. Not prepared for right? at all. And since become a momcologist, yes. right? And so you're yes. prepared in, to help other people now, but you weren't prepared at the time. Not at all. So battle, going into battling AML, which is pretty rare, I would say, right? Like, rare. like based on everything I could, I don't know a lot about it either. Yeah. Educate us. Like yeah. now that you know about the blood types of blood cancers and AML, can you maybe give us a just a, a, a palette of like the sure. different types of cancers and where this falls in terms of, you know, it seems like it was pretty somber when the doctor told you like, hey, yeah. you got to sit down for this one. Yeah. I think um, the big thing to note about leukemia is that um, leukemia research has come very far thanks to organizations like Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Yes. Um, but there's two types of childhood leukemia. Okay. There's acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, which has a 90% cure rate. Okay. Um, and still a devastating diagnosis, still a very, very harrowing treatment, mm-hmm. um, but a higher cure rate. Mm-hmm. And then there's AML. And the kind of the, do- the way the doctors explained it was there's two types. And you want him to have this one. And he didn't get that one. Mm-hmm. And so that was the devastation. It was like, we got, we got in the bad club, but we got in the like really, really bad club, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and Jennings, when he was originally diagnosed, was given a 50%, 50% chance of surviving at five years. So for me, that was like, that was probably the biggest gut punch was like, it's not zero, you know? Right. <laughs> but it's not like really, really good. Was this all in the same time frame in which you found out Cancer yeah, like within the first few 50% days. 50% chance of yeah. survival on average. Because I asked. Because I like want the information. Right, you want the information. Yeah. So it's it was high risk, about as high risk as it can yes. get, essentially. Yes. yes. And the, the challenges that come with that, obviously, to, or you know, you get the good side, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, like A-L-L, like yes. you'd rather have that if you yeah. had to choose between the two because yes. there's a higher cure rate. So this high risk comes with extra challenges. Um, can you maybe outline some of those extra challenges it just sure. is it just emotional from the perspective or is the treatments pretty yeah that's much? a really great question yeah. it's a really great question um i would say i would say mm, both more emotional for sure just taking in that information is really hard a lot of aml kids do really well and mm-hmm. they they do great it's just like statistically right. that's hard to swallow but how did, I, you, how did you manage that how did you swallow it well over time i learned that jennings is just not a statistic. He's not average. Yeah. He's just not a number. And um, we, uh, we have a faith that is greater than that. Mm. And we really believe that God holds his story and um, that God is good and whatever he has for our family and for Jennings. Uh, we believe that really, truly, even though it's hard sometimes to believe that. Um, so that is kind of what carried us through. And mm-hmm. I processed through that. Like it was really hard. And I still like grapple with like that, that he got AML and it's like so Ugh, like, you know, it's been f- over five years and I still feel that way, but just that's not his identity. That's mm-hmm. not his story. Mm-hmm. It's just a number. And honestly, it's an imperfect number. Statistics are never perfect. And it's just a bunch of human error trying to put together numbers and right. they right. do the best they can. Right. But that doesn't define his story and his path. Right. So your mindset was very strong. It's, you see, it almost seems the family would like, we're, OK, we're going to get we're going through this. Like, yeah. We're going to get through it no matter what. Like, yeah. And what choice do you have also? Right. Like right. in so many of our of our lives, there is a crossroads mm-hmm. where you get to choose the dark mm-hmm. or the light. And when you guys literally picked your life up, that's what you mean, I'm assuming, by flipping your life like not only yes. that but then you like physically flipped your life not emotionally as well and you picked up your your daughter caroline yes right um yes. she is the first donor yeah. um, so we could talk a little bit about the matching process and yep. and so caroline is the first donor and she's a little bit older she's 10 she's 10 right now. Oh, 10 yeah. now okay yeah. and so at the time she was she not was little. right she was about 
four, maybe five when she donated. And then you flip and you relocate to Memphis yeah. to be closer to the hospital. So yeah. walk us through that the, that process. Yeah. Like how um, did that all come to fruition? So we found out um, just the way the treatment works with AML is they want you to be in complete remission after your first round of chemo. Mm -hmm. How long does that take? Um, that's about a month. About a month. They want yeah. you to be completely in remission. Yeah. They'll go back and do it a bone marrow test or something? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And so we are praying for that, praying for that. But Jennings had just this like low level of residual disease in his bone marrow, which just like classified him as high risk. Mm -hmm. And so we found out that he would need a bone marrow transplant. And that was really scary, but it just, we began to accept it because that's what he needed for healing. Um, and so in order to get a bone marrow transplant, you need a bone marrow donor. Our bone marrow is our blood factory and it makes our blood and it spews out all of our red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. And his makes crappy cells that don't work. So we need to replace that essentially. And once you kind of, you, so you like pull it out and then replace yeah. it basically, right? Yeah, and that's it, the oversimplification uh, of Right, it, I'm trying to make yeah. sure that everybody <laughs> yeah. can follow this. No, it's, yeah, it is, yeah. It is very complicated. And I wasn't like saying that way. No, no, it's okay, it's yeah, okay, yeah. I, that's a very simplified way of saying okay. it. It is a grueling and a harrowing oh, process. Okay. So you essentially take your child to the edge of life and then bring them back again because you're depleting their blood system, mm -hmm. keeping them alive, right? Um, and then like, replacing their blood system. So to go back to your original question, yes, we found I needed, needed, a bone, needed a bone marrow transplant and you need a donor. So the process of that is um, there are donors out there, like, you know, be the match, like you get swabbed to be a bone marrow donor. Um, you can get someone from the registry to be your donor or you can have like a sibling, but it's very rare for a sibling to be a full match. Mm -hmm. And they want a full match mm -hmm. because that's easier on the body. Um, having those those that DNA fully matched because there's less likelihood of rejection of that organ, even though it's not a solid organ, it's a liquid organ. You want that like match to be really close. Mm -hmm. So we found out Caroline was a match, and it was like that good news bad news thing, you know? Right. It was like great, <laughs> yeah. but why do we even have to do this, you know? So right. it was happy, but also just like you know all those emotions. Mm -hmm. Did she um, understand it at the time? Very, you know, it was like very simple terms. Jennings' blood is sick. Your blood is healthy. He needs you. He needs some of your blood. Mm -hmm. And so that was his, of course she said yes. Like of she, you know. Right. Um, but in order to get that transplant, we had to move to Memphis because the hospital we're at in Charlotte is affiliated with St. Jude and we cannot get a bone marrow transplant at our local hospital in Charlotte at, Hem at, um, at Novant Health. Um, and we chose to go to St. Jude and we chose to uproot our family um, under wise counsel at that time. That was what we felt was the best for Jennings, the safest place to get a bone marrow transplant. And so, yeah, we got on a plane and I had two newborns. My mom came with me. She was carrying one newborn and I had one newborn. Jennings was there and Caroline was there. And I remember leaving their nursery, like their beautiful blue nursery that I had like made for them that was like picture perfect and ready to like lay them in their cribs. And we had to leave. We had to go live hospital life, live in a rental home that was very generously given to us, but still not ours, mm -hmm. and uproot our entire lives mm -hmm. and stay in Memphis. And um, yeah, so that's what that's what took us to Memphis. And so then he has the procedure, the blood, and then goes through the thirty days, and yes. then has a little bit of cancer left in the blood after thirty days. So by this point, by the time that we are moving to Memphis and he is getting the transplant or we're starting the transplant process, he's in remission. He is we've okay. achieved remission. Because the goal before you go to transplant is to achieve that remission. Got it, understood. Yeah. Um, that is the ideal scenario. Okay. Um, you can go have a transplant with with disease and people do do that, but it's the doctors really want all that to be clear. Um, because a transplant is like um, it's, it's not as targeted as like a car T or whatever. It's like a driver without a steering wheel. So you don't want the cancer to be in there because the, those blood cells may not find it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yes. Um, so you want everything to be completely depleted and then just replace it. It's really just replacing your sick blood that makes the bogus cells. And then you're, you think it's done? You think it's over? You think you're going to move on and... Yeah. Live yeah. a life cancer free and in yeah. full remission. What happens next? Well, you know, you don't ever really know, but I will say that you have a naive hope. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a hope and you and you should have hope. Why, why not? Right. Hope is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Hope fuels our souls. It gives us joy in our day. 
Um, hope is not, we shouldn't be ashamed of having hope. And I had hope. Um, and I didn't think a lot about the cancer coming back. Um, but I was naive to it. And I will say, so yes, we got home. He recovered. It was very hard. We had a lot of normalcy. Uh, then COVID hit. And so 2020 was actually the best year for the Palmer family. <laughs> like everyone else was like so traumatized. And the Palmer family was like, Jennings is healthy. We're at home. Like this pandemic yeah. is like not nothing, but like we're okay. You know, just had a different perspective mm -hmm. than everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a really great year. That's when I ran for woman of the year for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. It was just a really blessed season. Um, wrapped up my campaign. Um, the kit, Jennings started virtual kindergarten in the fall, and we were at the park one day. Um, we did like a park, park play dates because um, it was COVID and everyone was like getting together outside, you know? And I got this call from an unknown number and I didn't answer it. And then I looked back on like my iPhone, like voice transcript. And it was like, it's Dr. Talur, which is this transplant doctor. Chimerism came back, which is a test they take after bone marrow transplant doesn't look right please call me back and it's like it it was just so unbelievable like I hadn't even like thought that that was even we had come so far we're at two and a half years post transplant at this point and I will say the relapse it I'm still healing from it it was the most gutting thing you know for it to, when a cancer comes back it's shown itself and it was just devastating. Um, so we had to do pretty much the entire process again, a little bit different this time, and we did do some things differently. Um, but yeah, he had to have another bone marrow transplant. Moved to Memphis again. My husband was the donor this time, um, a half match, which um, is complicated. It's a complicated procedure, but his hospital is actually just amazing at that procedure. And so they were able, they want a half match at this point because the, the cancer has shown how aggressive it is. Mm -hmm. And they need that like kind of um, what they say, graft versus leukemia effect. They need that fight to happen. Mm -hmm. But you also don't want that, um, that, gra that graft to like attack the body either. So it's a dance that doctors have to do, um, trying, trying to kill the cancer and keep the patient alive and safe and healthy. Um, so he had that. And then he was part of a clinical trial um, in DC where he got some engineered super cells that went into his blood after transplant. Mm -hmm. So Joel and I are very proud that we, you know, took it as far as we could and advocated for him and got him at that time some of the best treatment available. That's, a, that's a, so, so it's, you basically go through the same exact hell twice. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's and this is all in a span of about two and a half, three, year, three years. Yeah. In which first diagnosis. Yeah. So 2017. In was, remission. Yep. And then it comes back. Yep. Yep. I just got to have a lot of uh, hope, mm -hmm. uh, faith, support. Yep. Yes. Community. Yeah. We during had a, those times. We had a lot of it. Yeah. Um, highlight some of the power of that support. You know, this, in a, this thing that you you you've got to face it. You've got yeah. to stand up and strong and face it. There's no other choice. That's right. You need people to stand with you, behind you. LLS, yeah. burn. Yes. Your trainer, your people. Yes. Your people in Memphis, your doctors. Yep. Talk to us a little bit about the power of that interesting combination between faith and community. Um, well, the community, like when you're going through a trauma like this, and it's it's a crisis. You are literally surviving, you know, going through the day each day and the intensity of being a medical family and a medical parent while raising four or three other healthy children is like, it's an intensity that I could spend an entire podcast describing and, and unpacking. Um, but what our community allowed us to do when we love on people who are experiencing a crisis and we support them, whether that's financially with prayer, with a workout, like seriously, like a workout was so life-giving to me. Like that was, I needed that. Like, that's my why. Maybe we'll get into that. It just helps me face the day. Um, well, prioritizing your own health. Yes, get into absolutely. It. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Like, that was a non-negotiable for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I had to move my body. I had to work out. I, was, I feel sluggish. And everything else feels sluggish. And you're in a hospital. It's like fluorescent lighting. Everything moves slowly. You don't, 
I'm like, you know, I'm um, lit up by people and like my friends and my community and just you, you lose all of that. Like you're going to clinic appointment, taking your kid to this and it's just draining. So you need your body to feel alive, you know, mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. And so working out was like a big, a big part of that for sure. Um, and burn was a big part of my healing in the aftermath. So the first time I stepped into a burn, I stepped into burn Pineville mm -hmm. when we got back from Memphis the first time. Okay. And I was a mess. And I remember almost crying in the workout because I was just like, this is too hard. Did anybody know what was I don't, going on at the time? Nobody knew anything. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really hard thing to do, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and then that, in that season of life, like, I, I kind of wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just moments where you have to just kind of, like, deal with stuff on your own. People don't know. Um, and I just kept showing up every single day. And... Well, not every single day. Most days. Most days. <laughs> most days. Yeah, let's be real. Most days. <laughs> yeah, most days. Right? Um, most days. And have been a part of that community since, well, that would have been 2018 because it would have been yep. the year after everything. Um, and because of medical stuff, I've had to be in and out. Like with the relapse, obviously, I wasn't there. But um, it's been a steady place for me to go to um, love, care for myself, pour into myself so I can pour out to my family, love my son, love my growing kids. And, and husband and so as you're finding this new community in burn um it takes a minute for people to for you to share your story and for yeah. people to really wrap their arms around you but when they do it feels really good yeah and uh you know obviously lls is woman of the year uh, yeah. uh your campaign there for woman of the year and you just being that voice like we talked about for lls mm -hmm. how how is how has the organization um supported you through these times well i think what is so special about OLS is um, their focus on the cure. There's so many wonderful organizations that do so many things. But what I want is this for the, this to be done mm -hmm. and for a mom to never have to walk through this again. And I want a mom like me to hear, your son has AML. The cure rate is 95%. It's going to be okay. It's going to be hard. But he's going to be all right. And that's not the reality that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But LLS gives me hope because of the work that they are doing that we are going to get there. But it's gritty work. Mm -hmm. it, it's gritty work. Mm -hmm. But it's being done. Mm -hmm. LLS is not afraid of facing the challenges um, in the pediatric cancer space that um, have held up cures and, and, and targeted drugs for years. They've acknowledged it mm -hmm. and they are facing it head on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's why I am proud yeah. to be aligned with them. Yeah and proud to ask for people to donate because I know that those dollars really make a difference in, in research. We see that with the Be Their Hero event that we partner with LLS on too. You, you know, like you represent moms and dads all across the country. I had a um, friend uh, from high school uh, who lives in, up in Michigan and her daughter, I believe was AML. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my first, uh, how would you say, experience yeah. as an adult, as a parent of having somebody really close to me that I've known my whole life, like have, go through this. And, yeah. you know, I just know that when speaking with her back home, we've seen each other a couple times. Um, she always talks about how it made her strong, like a, her and her family now that they're in remission and mm -hmm. that everything is moving forward um, and progressing nicely. Not that it, not that they would it wouldn't make them stronger if there was a different outcome. Right. We're thankful for the outcome that yeah. that's there and with Jennings yes. too, obviously, right? And yeah. But like it teaches you hard lessons. Like it it's this pain mm -hmm. that is so deep, mm -hmm. right? That you inevitably become a stronger individual. Yeah. You have to be almost. That's right. Right. So talk to me about and talk to us really. Mm -hmm. This would be a time if you really want to address anybody's directly that mm -hmm. you can that you can do so but what lessons have you really learned and mm -hmm. how has the Palmer family um, changed mm -hmm. now and into the future the change is so abundant and so there's so much you know <laughs> like to so I feel challenged to um, summarize it you know mm -hmm. um, maybe the one the mm -hmm. one thing the most that you could say like this gave me and my family X. It made a strength stronger. Yeah. It made a weakness yeah. strong. It, 
it just gave us perspective mm. that you don't want to get. And I still like, I hate, I hate, I loathe, I detest <laughs> the way that I got it. But at the same time, you're holding equally this intense grief and this abundant perspective that you can't manufacture in somebody who hasn't experienced that. And so I get to look at life with really deep gratitude. I feel, in this moment, I literally feel giddy with gratitude that I get to go pick up my kids from school today, take them to a doctor's appointment, um, make them dinner tonight, fold their laundry, like all these things. So really, it's, I think it comes down to that the ordinary moments that you think are so mundane and so simple are like the greatest gift that you have in life. And all the things that we chase and that we think are the greatest are like really not. And so I think it's that the ordinary is the extraordinary. I think that's the lesson. And so I'm able to live a life of joy in the ordinary. And I, I couldn't do that before. Perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's good. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so glad you're here today, by the way. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. We, honored to be here. Yeah. No, this, I'm, I'm, I'm giddy, too. This is fun. <laughs> this is fun. And it's, uh, you know, I just want to express gratitude that I have for you, you know, coming in on, this, on this podcast. You know, you're able to reach thousands of people mm -hmm. at once. And, you know, it's pretty rare to go through... Um, you know, this type of, this type of, you know, run around <laughs> in a sense, like yeah. hearing remission, uh-oh, yeah. rewind, you yeah. know, and like, that's just a, it feel, probably feels like you're just have puppet strings on you getting pulled with no control and, yeah. you know, and everybody has their own version of that. Yeah. Right. And no matter what we're going through in our life, trauma is, it's real. It's nobody's mountain is steep, less steep or more steep than anybody else's. And, right. and, you know, um, I just, appreciate the vulnerability that you have being here you know being in one of those extreme cases of pain and mm -hmm. uh, um, you know potential suffering and well, actual suffering yeah. i'm sure yeah um but the gratitude that we have for you coming here sharing your story not only can help those who are dealing with exactly what you're dealing with and, and going through and dominating but also you know the lesser the less intense things out there yeah that sometimes you know, we just lose perspective on it. We do. We lose perspective on the world, and those things can help us bring it back in a way, if there was any silver lining. Yeah. Well, know? there's a lot of shiny things in the world that try to distract us and make right. us feel like that's going to ultimately make us happy, you know? And um, I think sometimes we all just need a little bit of, yeah, a perspective shift. Well, and I know. Yeah, so keep going. Sorry. I was just going to say that, that, yeah, that's why I sit here, that I hope that um, I know people, even if I never know, I know that sharing our stories not just me, but all of us sharing our stories um, impacts people in ways that we'll never understand. And yeah. I think it's just being faithful to do that. And it is your story, and we—it's uh, hard, but I'm proud of it. If that's that's weird to say, um, but it is. I am, and um, like I said, honored to that you guys would, and, and very much appreciate your um, tender approach to it, and um, the time that you took to understand our family. Um, and to get into the details, mm -hmm. that really matters, and I really appreciate it. Well, you guys are a family. You know, we love you guys. We're so happy to have you, uh, at least in some part, comforted by the arms of Burn Boot Camp yeah. during this process. And, you know, um, we're going to continue to throw up uh, all the prayers that we have in, in our heart for you and your family and Jennings' continued prosperity and recovery. And Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank everybody also for being here and, and, and enjoying this interview uh, with Lauren and, you know, just encourage your participation you know, in the LLS event, the Be Their Hero event, to break out your pocketbook, break out your wallets, get get your money out and help these families. Like, yes. it's so important that we do that. Uh, it's As you mentioned, LLS has come a long way in getting to the cure, and we couldn't do that without the donations from the communities that support That's right. people like um, Lauren and, and the Palmers. And so thank you for being here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. The Be Their Hero campaign uh, is... Uh, it's here, okay? It's here. So donate, break it out. We'll look forward to raising a whole bunch of money, comforting a whole lot of families, and hopefully getting to the cure faster. That's right. Faster, all right? We're going to end it like we always do. Two claps on two. One, two.